Welcome back. With this lecture, we're going to start uh, looking at uh, the problem with Arianism, and this will be uh, part two. I need to explain that uh, on Moodle, you'll see that there is uh, another set of PowerPoints entitled 10.1, uh, The Trinitarian Debates, number four, Creeds. This is a uh, a lecture that was designed to sort of tell us a little bit about the uh, Nicene Creed uh, of uh, 325 and it's uh, how it came to be in the culmination or the ending of what was uh, the uh, the debate about Arianism uh, part one. So Arianism part one that we uh, just dealt with uh, led to the Council of Nicaea in 325. And I posted the PowerPoints there, but I've decided not to post the lecture a video for those because uh, I'm, I ended up just reading uh, those slides and I thought that would be uh, rather pointless to have you uh, just listen to me read. Uh, you could read it for yourself. And so I would, uh, I would ask you uh, to read through those slides. You have the uh, the outline notes there for, again, that was 10.1, the Trinitarian Debates, number four, about the uh, the creeds. And there's some other information there about uh, the Apostles' Creed and about creeds generally. But I've decided in this particular uh, lecture now to just move on to the next one of the uh, the next phase of the debates uh, over Arianism, and uh, this lecture will have to be divided into two parts. So this is, I uh, hope it's not confusing, this is uh, the uh, Arianism, let me put the Arianism phase two, part one. Uh, and so I'll try to make this one a little shorter and then uh, we'll have a slightly longer lecture to finish this up. So uh, with all of that, let me uh, get to it finally. Again, this is Arianism phase two, just after the Council of Nicaea. And again, you're going to be reading about that council in the uh, notes for the uh, uh, lecture that I'm not recorded. Uh, <clears throat> but just after that council, it was already becoming clear that even at this early post-Nicene stage that the West, or the Western Church in Rome, was uh, much more uniformly inclined to accept the Nicene Creed, which was decidedly anti-Arian and pro-Trinitarian, but the East still had sympathies with uh, the Arian uh, ideas. And a number of bishops who were not pro-Arian, but they weren't anti-Arian either. Uh, so they tried to find a middle ground between the two, as yes, you could say. After the deliverances of the Council of Nicaea, Arius was exiled. Uh, basically, the, the council officially denied uh, his point of view and affirmed the point of view of Alexander of Alexandria and Athanasius. But those with Arian-like ideas didn't go away, and some continued to, to use the term Homoi usias, the son is like or of similar essence to the father. Uh, complicating matters even further, the, the Arians had the political support of Constantius, who was the emperor who, who came after uh, uh, Constantine. For the whole fourth century, the political state of things kept shifting back and forth. Uh, and we don't have time to get into that. That's more like church history anyway. Uh, and some Arians kept advocating their theology, and as long as they had political support, they sort of think that they were on top. Uh, some of them had uh, views that weren't as radical as Arius, and some had views that were even more radical than Arius. So it was, uh, fourth century was kind of a difficult time to follow exactly what all the debates and what they meant. Uh, like Arius in... Uh, 324, 325, at the time of the Council of Nicaea, the more radical Arians after Nicaea appear to be more interested in what Jesus is not rather than describing him positively. Their emphasis was that he was of a different essence from the Father. He is unlike the Father. 
Uh, he is a created being. This was what the, uh, they said uh, over and over again. The non-radical bishops, not pro-Aryan, not anti-Aryan, kept trying to find a way to restate the Nicene Creed without that term homoousios. They tried another term. This is where it gets a little confusing. Homoians, a term that meant the Son is like the Father, but not of the same essence. So it was, it was, um, it was sort of like this other term. You can see there, other Aryans kept advocating for homoousios, uh, understood in a forthrightly Aryan way, but this kept going back and forth uh, over these terms. However, it was Athanasius, who I said uh, is really the hero, it was diligent in defending the Nicene Creed and this term homoousios. He maintained a consistent and almost inflexible commitment to the principle expressed by homoousios. Even when the Arians lost their political supporter, uh, for a time a non-Christian emperor, very briefly was the emperor, Julian the Apostate, he's called, uh, their, their support for their views considerably weakened. So again, things had, uh, were in flux all the way through the 4th century with political and theological uh, problems. In the years to follow, the Nicene Party was reinvigorated by the writings of the Cappadocians, Basil the Great of Caesarea, uh, his brother Gregory of Nyssa, and their very close friend Gregory of Nazianzus. And I really wish I had more time to delve into uh, uh, the writings and background of these three uh, Cappadocians, the Cappadocian Fathers, as they're called. Um, and I would encourage you to read up some more on them because they really are uh, the, the benchmark for orthodoxy. I've had you do some uh, part of your reading from uh, Gregory of Nazianzus. After a summary of the parties and persons involved, in the post-Nicene uh, decades and, uh, and the debates, uh, one author writes this, all of these people and events culminated in the first council of Constantinople. Even here, no Western bishops were present, but the council did reaffirm Nicaea. Gregory of Nazianzus presided uh, originally over its head and Emperor Theodosius, yet another emperor, supported the decision. So what happened was after, again, the Nicene Creed of 325, which I will say again, you're going to read about on those other PowerPoint slides, uh, was had to be uh, refined. It had to be made more clear. So a council in Constantinople in 381 uh, did just that. At the Council of Constantinople, the Creed of Nicaea was reaffirmed and revised, and the term homoousios was decreed to be the official Orthodox teaching. Even the Spirit was said to be equal to the Father. That was something in the first creed that wasn't absolutely clear uh, in the second iteration of uh, what's come to be known as the Nicene Creed. It was made very clear. The Spirit is also equal to the Father, equally God. In this way, all forms of theological subordination were condemned. Again, we said that's what Arius' doctrine did. It subordinated the Son to the Father. Um, but in the uh, final version of the Nicene Creed, all of that was uh, eliminated. The persons of the Son and Spirit were definitely declared to be fully divine, as fully as the Father is God, they are God. And with this victory, the anti-Nicene parties, or Arianism, went into a steep decline. But, because Aryan missionaries had evangelized the barbarians, the Goths, the Vandals, and others outside of the realm of the Roman Empire, Arianism still thrived in these populations. Um, at one point, there may have actually been more Aryan Christians than uh, so-called Orthodox Christians, because uh, a lot of these uh, tribes, uh, again, what were called barbarians, had been converted to a form of Christianity that was basically uh, Aryan. Regardless where the where Christianity survived in the West, uh, the Nicene Creed was what was upheld. So uh, with that, we're going to then uh, pause uh, 
this uh, short, uh, shorter lecture in order to uh, move on to uh, the rest of the debates about Arianism in phase two. And uh, that lecture is going to be somewhat longer. See you then.